Behind the gleaming face of Dallas lies a war zone. Police spend half a billion dollars a year fighting drugs, but they're losing the war. I believe I could do a better job. So the black community, at odds with the mostly white police force, is taking matters into its own hands. But what we're doing, no one else has dared do. We're challenging the pushers and the drug houses directly. Tonight on Frontline, the Dallas Drug War. The Dallas Drug War is an encore presentation of Frontline. First produced in 1989, the documentary examines the city's rising drug problem at that time. Good evening, I'm Marjorie Ford. Tonight, we'll take a fresh look at the issue in a studio discussion with some of the participants in the documentary immediately following Frontline. Stay with us. From the network of public television stations, a presentation of KCTS Seattle, WNET New York, WPBT Miami. WTVS Detroit, and WGBH Boston. This is Frontline with Judy Woodruff. Good evening. A year after national drug czar William Bennett declared Washington, D.C. a test case in the war on drugs, he recently admitted that the battle isn't going as well as he had hoped. Bennett's strategy there and in the rest of the country has largely focused on expanding police forces and building more prisons. But cities across America are finding that fighting the drug war is more than fighting crime. They must also confront the social, economic, and political problems that plagued the community before drugs did. Tonight, in a program we first broadcast a year ago, Frontline examines the drug war in one neighborhood in one American city the Dallas Drug War. Our program was produced by Hector Galan. The correspondent is Bob Ray Sanders of Dallas Public Television Station, KERA. Dallas, Texas, March 1988. Get your hands out the window! Get back, back, back on the Get him on the ground. The Dallas Police Tactical Unit confronts two suspected drug dealers in a supermarket parking lot. Last year, the Dallas Police made over 10,000 drug arrests in a city that has quickly become a major drug trafficking center. Here, in America's seventh largest city, drugs are everywhere. Former car salesman Steve Gherkin was part of a $6 million a year cocaine ring that allegedly included a Dallas businessman and a lawyer. Last year, in a battle over turf, Gherkin killed another drug dealer with a car bomb. In the city's fashionable West End, police raided the Trendy Star Club, arresting 37 people for buying and selling cocaine. Some of them were allegedly snorting it straight off the club's bar. And last fall, at W.T. White High School in North Dallas, an undercover officer posing as a student conducted a four-month drug investigation. The police then arrested 28 people, including nine students, for selling marijuana, cocaine, and LSD. I want to see them go to the can, where they belong. This is a really serious matter about, you know, inside the school. People up here selling joints and stuff, smoking in the bathroom all the time. This is terrible. It is, really. Like all American cities, Dallas is trying to fight a war against drugs. But this is a city that is also at war with itself. Dallas is a divided city, divided by politics, by class, and by race. Demographically, half of the city's one million residents are black or Hispanic. Geographically, the city is split by the Trinity River and the interstate highway system. Most whites live north of the line. Almost all the blacks live here, on the black side of town. South Dallas is home to more than 100,000 people. Traditionally, it has been a stable and close-knit community. South Dallas has some of the city's oldest neighborhoods, and roots here are deep. In the 40s, many black families began moving to Dallas from farms in East Texas. Many of their children were raised here in South Dallas. And today, 
This is a community full of people who don't want to live anywhere else. We bought here because this house was built in 1895, and uh, my husband and I have enjoyed uh, redecorating it and painting it and uh, making it look like a home. Dorothy Davis and her husband Theodore are both school teachers. They have lived in this house in South Dallas for 15 years. When you hear bullets all night, you, you, you're afraid for your life. You're just afraid. The Davis family has seen serious changes in their once peaceful neighborhood. When oil prices plummeted in the 80s, the recession hit Dallas hard and South Dallas even harder. The unemployment rate here is now twice as high as North Dallas. And as city leaders continued to neglect South Dallas, it became an inevitable breeding ground for drugs. Today, the police call it the war zone. They told me what to expect when I came home for the summer. They're like, Julie, the neighborhood has changed. And I thought, well, it can't be that bad. Maybe a few minor changes here and there, but um, I worry, I value their safety. I really do worry about their, their you know, are they, are they going to be safe at night? Is someone just going to break in and maybe, you know, take their lives? The Davises have two daughters in college. Last summer, Jackie was away studying in Los Angeles. But Julie was home on break from Atlanta. It hasn't been peaceful since I've been home for the summer. Not one night. It hasn't been peaceful. There's gunshots every night, every single night. The Davis family invited Frontline to spend a couple of nights with them to see for ourselves. Through their living room window, we watched using a camera equipped with a night viewing device. As night fell, activity picked up on the streets outside. Inside, Dorothy turned to a fresh page in her notebook where she keeps a log of the shootings each night. As the camera continued to roll, the Davises and our crew huddled on the living room floor in the dark. Nobody really believes that this goes on in your neighborhood. This is almost like being at war. It has come to the point that I, that as a family, we need to do something about it. Because this is, this is just getting to be ridiculous. A lot of people probably say, you know, why don't you just get out and move out? But uh, I didn't, uh, the environment came to me. The thing that bothers me about the crack houses and the drugs being sold in my neighborhoods is the shooting of the guns. Now that bothers me. It's frightening because you're like, oh my goodness, are they shooting toward our house? Is it going to hit our house? Are the bullets going to come through a window? And it's very, it's just very nerve wracking. I think about my family, you know, true enough, number one. But I also think about uh, just the innocent people around. A 12 year old innocent girl that was in the I Have a Dream program and had planned to go to college was innocently killed just because someone was walking around with a a high, powerful gun. Last summer, just half a block from Dorothy's home, sixth grader Machetta Morns was shot to death as she stood on the steps of her friend's house. There have been more than 20 drug-related murders in the Davis's neighborhood. No, man, I said, you get out of my yard. Reverend Tom Thompson has lived in the same house in this neighborhood for 32 years. So somebody, I didn't see the man, come up the alley. And then he made two shots. He shot one first time out there, and the man ran up here on my porch. This is when he tried to get him coming up on my porch. You see, but I never did see the man, because I'm sitting here on my porch. But I can't get him going no running and nothing like that. He might shoot me. It's terrible in South Dallas. It's a threat to the whole black community. I teach my child uh, 
drugs is not the way out. But he has no chance when he comes into the community. You can teach truth in the home, but if you don't come together in the streets, it's all useless. Don't have enough people want to stop it. It's too much money. It's so much money involved until the people that can actually handle it don't want to stop it. And the little man can't do nothing about it. It's wide open, wide open. It's all in this community. Every corner you turn, there it is. Talk to me. I thought I was moving to a better location, better atmosphere for my children, but didn't really know what I was getting myself into. Like several times I have been standing on my porch waiting for my ride, and a couple of people have asked me if I know where to get some cocaine. You can't ride down the street without somebody almost getting hit by your car trying to stop you, you know, sell you drugs. I've gotten calls from the police chief to say we're doing something about it. I'll be out there in the next two weeks. And, 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 and things go on as they have normally gone. They should be more concerned about it. And this is, this is uh, the, the, the final weapons is not only uh, in this neighborhood, uh, it's, it's round about the city. The police know what's going on up here. When this shot, but they're right here, you say, you have to be careful. You see what's going on? I say, yeah. I say, how come y'all can't do something about it? No answer. I am angry. Because I feel like that, that if you care for all of the citizens in a city, then you would do something about it. Dallas police officer Chris Hackbarth has patrolled South Dallas for more than a year. It's still pretty bad down here. They're going through the alleys here, and they're and all they do is back and forth, back and forth. And these drug dealers are taking the lifeblood right out of South Dallas. All those people sitting up there, they're a bunch of them are good eyes for the crack house. They see a cop coming and they yell a code word and by the time anybody gets there, their crack's already gone. They've got one good eye in the front of the apartment complex, wooden good eye in the back. You drive up and there's no way that you'll, you'll be able to, uh, to surprise them. I don't know, the owner put up fences around their apartment complexes, but it takes a day or two and they rip holes through them, tear them down. Top floor there is a crack house. They're not operating it today because there's no lookouts. The city's primary response to the drug problem in South Dallas has been a show of force. Last year, the police staged well over a thousand drug raids in South Dallas. They estimate that there are now more than 400 major drug houses in this community, almost all of them selling crack. Hector, you got some little rocks here with this crack. They just squeeze it up real good. This, what you can do is, if you feel it, if you feel it, it's real mushy. You take it, roll it into a ball, and smoke it real easily. It's cheap. It's highly addictive. It is uh, the primary factor in, in a, a great portion of all the crimes that are occurring in this division. The man the Dallas Police Department assigned to protect South Dallas was Deputy Chief Ray Hawkins. And there's tremendous amounts of profit to be made uh, by the sale of crack. Uh, I've never seen any drug that, that had that kind of an impact on the community. The police estimate that the crack houses in South Dallas take in more than half a million dollars a day. The drug trade here is controlled by Jamaican and Cuban gangs who moved in from New York and Miami. Police believe these gangs are responsible for 70 murders in the past two years. But despite the thousands of arrests, the police admit that they rarely capture the kingpins who control drugs in Dallas. City Hall, 9 a.m. Last August, Dorothy Davis brought her frustrations to Mayor Annette Strauss and the rest of the city council. It was the second time she had been here. I don't understand why Mayor Annette Strauss has not come out. I don't understand why all of the city council members don't walk these streets so they'll know 
Come out and spend the night, and you will see what's going on. The city council has 11 members representing Dallas's 1 million residents. But while half the city's population is black or Hispanic, the city council has only three minority members. Council members Al Lipscomb and Diane Ragsdale represent South Dallas. You know, this city has been, uh, it's a very strange place because usually the elite business leadership, primarily white men, uh, dictate the direction of this given city. Uh, and now what's taking place is that people are, people are trying to uh, force those very people to share some of the economic power and to share some of the political power. In talking to Mr. Garrigan, his Dorothy had expected to speak to the council in the morning, but by noon, she was still waiting. They recommend to us, they don't make decisions like that. These two council persons only have two votes out of 11 members in the city council. Uh, that doesn't give them what you would call a significant amount of power. Dr. Paul Geisel is director of urban studies at the University of Texas at Arlington. For almost 20 years, he has advised Dallas leaders on racial problems in the city. Uh, in Dallas, we've historically had a business community that has brought forth most of the proposals for change and development in the city. If you wanted to get something done, you went to that oligarchy. We, we want to make order. Dallas whatever is necessary to attract the next big company. That does not mean improving inner city neighborhoods. That means improving upper income neighborhoods and making them ever so much more pleasant and protective. Gee, I'm tired. I've been here all day. Good afternoon. My name is Dorothy Davis. I live at Finally, at 545, Dorothy got her three minutes in front of the council. Just this morning, while speaking to a neighbor who was sweeping glass, I looked down and to my amazement, I found this shiny bullet that I hold before you. I have constantly called the police department, I've called several council members, and I have constantly reported the shooting that goes on in my neighborhood. Miss Davis, yes. two weeks ago, you came and you showed me an I envelope. still have them with the new one. Well, yes. and I know Miss Hart spoke to you and someone was supposed to meet with you to try to help you. Whatever happened? They spoke, they came, they talked to me, but the shooting still goes on. Constantly, all night. Just two days ago, two men have been shot. Thank you very kindly, Ms. Davis. Thank you, Ms. Davis. I hope we'll be able to help you. This type of environment can create a sense of powerlessness. This type of environment can create a sense of hopelessness. People ask me the question all the time. Why is it that we hire these officers and they don't even reduce the crime in our community? This is how the Dallas police are fighting drugs in their city. These officers are on their way to a crack house where earlier an undercover agent had made a drug buy. Now all that remains is to make the arrest and seize the drugs. In South Dallas, police make as many as 10 raids like this a day. More than 40% of the drug raids in Dallas end up like this one. No dealers, no drugs. Increasingly, the police are confronted by heavily fortified crack houses. And sometimes they are simply outsmarted by the dealers. We make a tremendous amount of arrests in that area. We seize an awful lot of weapons. Uh, we seize an awful lot of drugs and money. Uh, but as you can see, that has not arrested that particular problem. And the people of South Dallas are left wondering if the police have already lost the war on drugs. If they are going to do something, I have not seen evidence of that. It, it could be that I'm naive and I don't know how the police department fights crime, but I believe I could do a better job. She has a right to expect a better quality of life than what she's got uh, in her neighborhood. Uh, 
she's one of those individuals that this is her home. She doesn't want to move. She wants the criminals to move. And, and we're going to do everything that we can uh, to help her. You don't know the community. So that's another factor of stopping crime, is getting to know the people in the community. Know the people on your beat. Uh, Chief Hawkins has never come to meet me. Because I was talking to you. I was giving you information anyway based upon what was going on. The man the police do send to talk to the people of South Dallas is Levi Williams, the department's civilian director of community affairs. I can think of this one incident where we had a crack house. And of course, uh, the people in the area said, well, they, these people have never been busted. And of course, we go in, there's a crack deal going on. And they, the vice makes the buy, they bust them. And then we check the records, they've been busted four times. Now, they're not in the same house, but they just moved down the street. Or they just sent in other people to work the area. So the people are frustrated. And what you get to hear at that point, what, what are the police doing? And then you get the people that, that's just fed up. And don't see the type of environment that I've been looking at for some time. I try to stay away from telling people, where are we busted this guy six or seven times? They don't want to hear that. They want to see the police department doing something that's going to make a tremendous difference in that area. Can you tell me why these people would be out here on the street, especially right down here, without no lights? No reason other than to sell and buy drugs. Another major police drug enforcement strategy in South Dallas is to stop and question anyone who looks suspicious. But that's a problem because in this almost entirely black community, nearly 80% of the officers patrolling it are white. Get your hand out of your pocket. Get your hand out of your pocket. There's a lot of people in the area that do not trust the police. What are you doing back here? Just sitting here talking to some old friends. You live here? No, sir, I'm, I'm in the service, sir. What business you got staying out here in back of an apartment complex? Right. I thought he knew somebody. My you thought he knew somebody? Back here, sir. Huh? What are you doing back here? I'm just sitting here, sir, talking Whose to Whose car people, is this? Sir. My mother. Oh, okay, can you, can you all step out, please? Put everything on truck, thanks. Your your After a thorough search of the car and its occupants, Officer Hackbarth would find no drugs and make no arrests. Any drugs or anything on you? No. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Last year, the city received almost a thousand complaints about police harassment, abuse, and brutality from the citizens of South Dallas. Okay, now in terms of the complaint, the officer has the right to pat you down when you got out of the car. Any time that you have someone that's complaining about excessive force uh, or not communicated with, with an officer that well, you usually store it in your memory bank. People see the police as a suppressor because the police has to carry out the order, so to speak. But the most serious complaints against the police involve their use of deadly force. Get up! Get up, police! Get up! Pull out his hands, man. He's, uh, he's awake. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead and mess with him. Get your hands out from under that blanket now. Now! In the last three years alone, Dallas police shot 67 people. Who else is in here? 22 of them died. One of the most shocking police killings happened in 1973 when a young burglary suspect was shot in the head while he sat handcuffed in a police car. His name was Santos Rodriguez. He was 12 years old. Since that time, Dallas has fought a series of racial and political battles over an unending string of police shootings. Santos Rodriguez was clearly a watershed. It was an opportunity for change. What we didn't get here was an accountable system. And I think there were those who thought there would. The city didn't take that opportunity because it didn't have to. Other kinds of priorities took on. We're growing right now. We're booming. Things are good. Don't rock the boat. So in the final analysis, minority members were told, we'll get to that later. The officer who killed Santos Rodriguez was eventually sentenced to five years. Daryl Kane served 18 months. But over the next 15 years, the Dallas police would shoot and kill more than 100 citizens, most of them black or Hispanic. 
A routine investigation appeared anything but routine. In 1986, the black community was outraged when police killed 70-year-old Etta Collins, who had called to report a burglary in progress. We declare an official day of mourning in the city of Dallas. It is just what everyone had feared. In Dallas, once again, a black victim is dead. killed by. Then, bullets. less than a year later, 81-year-old Crime Watch volunteer David Horton was shot to death by the police as he chased a burglary suspect. After these killings, the black community demanded help from the federal government. And in 1987, they got a congressional hearing to examine whether the Dallas police were using excessive force against minority citizens. Does the police department contradict this set of facts? Where do we stand? As far as the details of the investigation and how those things came to light. After 18 hours of testimony, the committee strongly criticized the department's record and its policies, but never issued a formal report. The two black members of the city council, Diane Ragsdale and Al Lipscomb, have been the most vocal critics of the police. It just doesn't make sense for us to keep on killing these people with, these, with some of these racist white policemen in these areas when they have been sensitized to deal with the cultural differences. Let's say, if, for instance, that you have a team of officers and we say, well, we know in this five, four, two blocks that there's nothing but crack houses. So we're going to go down there and crack heads and kick butts, right? If they make one mistake, and you have already talking about a problem between police and community, a city that have already had a congressional hearing because of deadly force. They made one mistake. That one mistake is magnified ten times. So the police have to handle this with kid gloves. The climate in Dallas right now, as far as the things that really scare me the most, is if I ever have to use deadly force, I don't want to be crucified by you know, some people, some powers to be in city leadership, you know, because there's always going to be 20-20 hindsight and people are going to second guess you. But I don't want to have that affect my judgment that, you know, I don't act the way I should. I don't protect my partner. I don't protect myself as far as using deadly force or using a different type of force. You know, I don't want to have somebody get hurt because I hesitated that split second because I, I was unsure if I'm going to get crucified in the press or get brought up on civil, civil charges or lose my job. When you criticize a given officer's behavior, it's amazing to me how, uh, how most of those officers will take that personally and how, you know, this whole fraternity and brotherhood, you know, is this really, uh, yeah, see, they, they just start circulating and, you know, the brotherhood and the fraternity makes it very difficult to uh, isolate the bad apples, the sense of brotherhood, you know. You know, so that's the problem, it's the bad apples. Some of those guys are rotten. In 1986, the police struck back at their critics. Angered by what they saw as a continued lack of support for the officers in the field, the predominantly white Dallas Police Association marched on City Hall to demand action against council members Ragsdale and Lipscomb. We feel that the city council should, at the very least, censure these two council members in order that both Ms. Mr. Lipscomb and Ms. Ragsdale publicly apologize to the citizens of Dallas and to the officers of the Dallas Police Department. The most proper action for Mr. Lipscomb and Ms. Ragsdale to take after their apology would be for both to resign from the City Council of Dallas. Racial tensions reached a new peak in Dallas early last year, but this time the trigger was the murder of two police officers. In January, Officer James Joe was shot and killed as he confronted two burglars. Less than two weeks later, Officer John Chase was killed by a mentally disturbed black man in a downtown parking lot. An angry police chief, Billy Prince, placed part of the blame on council members Ragsdale and Lipscomb. The atmosphere that's been created by the numerous critics, I think, has certainly contributed to a person who might be on the edge of something like this going forward with it. The friends and families of the predominantly white Dallas Police Association quickly organized a massive show of support for the police. The marchers urged every driver in Dallas to turn on his headlights, and many did. Police officers are your friends. But the black community saw these demonstrations as sympathy only for the slain white officer 
and those feelings boiled over at a dramatic city council meeting as Diane Ragsdale accused the organizers of treating the black officer's death as an afterthought. That painful confrontation last year seemed to sum up all that separated the two groups who have most at stake in the Dallas drug war. The murder of five police officers split the white and black communities even further. And the racial tensions in this city have kept leaders of both sides away from the most pressing needs, the deep social and economic problems that sustain the drug crisis in South Dallas. In the war zone, Dorothy Davis continued her nightly vigil discouraged by the response from the police and City Hall. Outside her living room window, for the drug pushers, it was business as usual. Ooh, yeah, <laughs> that gives my goosebumps goosebumps just thinking about it. I'm gonna give that away to caller number eight. Nobody sleeps. Everybody be out, the crackheads, the prostitutes, the drug dealers. This big money is fast, easy to get, very easy, very easy. How could you do this to me? If they have fifty thousand dollars worth of dope, then that's what they'll make back, plus a little interest. This young mother of three grew up in South Dallas. For the past three years, she has also been a crack dealer. Sometimes, she says, making over $100,000 a year while working for one of the drug gangs. I have workers that are bodyguard me, watch me. I have workers that will sit, sit in apartments and sell drugs. I have workers that will bring customers to the place. I have workers that will watch for cops. Some places can make 1000 a day. Some can make 5000 some can make 50000 a week. It all depends on the quantity and if it's good. If it's 98 or 99% pure, it'll go quick. Like a jack-in-the-box, you pop in with your money, give your money, you get what you want, go. Most older men get involved in drugs because they can't find a job. They can't find no work nowhere. Don't nobody want to hire them. Y'all have a good one, man. You too, man. But the young kids get in it for the gold, the money, the cars, the guns. I had a lot of kids where they would tell me they'd be 18, 19 years old. Come to find out those kids be 14 years old. Most of them I'd fire. Most of them made me good money. But I just get tired of looking at them and I fire them. Go on home, go to school. Most of the crack workers in South Dallas are teenagers, recruited by gang leaders to serve as lookouts, runners, and street dealers. Over half the children in the war zone live below the poverty line and teenage unemployment in South Dallas has climbed to more than 40 percent. No jobs, and they ain't got nothing else to do, so somebody come up to them and ask them to sell, so they, you know, they start selling. And then come, they come addicted to all that money they be making, and they, and can't, they can't stop. stop. It's just, yeah. They get a job making three thirty-five, and somebody offer them $100 a day, which one do you think they're going to take? I just think it's something that they want to try for themselves, you know. Because, you know, to tell you the truth, can't nobody make up your own mind. It's, you know, it's what you want to do. One kid was pretending he was the uh, crack man. One kid was pretending he was buying crack. And I said, Lord have mercy. What a loss. You live in the big life, in the fast life. That's what it's all about. Tyrone is 15 years old. Last year, he finally decided to stop dealing drugs and go back to school. He says he had been selling crack since he was 11. The thing that you learn when you're young, it takes over as you get older, you know? And 
seeing the stuff that was around me, it just took over. You know, as I got older, and I just thought that I wanted to sell dope, you know? Yeah, I got it. When I was working for someone, we would make from like a thousand to twelve hundred dollars a week, you know, working hey, for them. Hey, hey, listen, you want some age? But then when you get into the business for yourself, you set your goal to how much money you want to make. Look, look, look. Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, you make anywhere from nine hundred to about fifteen hundred dollars. But then on Thursday, Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays, you can make. Ten, eleven thousand dollars. You know, it's fast. Payday, you know. The business must have been pretty good tonight, huh? The faster you make it, you spend it. Just spend, spend, spend. You never know what's gonna happen, so you just live it up while you can. You take a real cool person out to sit and think, who the drugs go to? My mother could be getting this. My father could be buying this. For God's sakes, my child could have. Sitting bottle rock and I don't know. You don't know who get it. It start eating at your conscience after a while, you know. Seeing all these fiends and stuff, how they just killing themselves with this dope, you know. So everywhere you look, it's a dope house, you know. Drugs. That's what it's all about, you know. It's seven dollars. The drug pushers came into the community in a vacuum. They came in with no competition. They they captured our youth without any competition. Fahim Minka has lived in South Dallas for 30 years. He and his wife Marilyn are trying to raise their four children in the middle of the war zone. Communities are hell under siege. And this is a form of terrorism. The people are terrorized. Even if they're not directly face-to-face -face threatened by the pushers, just the shooting and automatic weapons and the knowledge of what they do to one another uh, psychologically places the people in a state of fear. Twenty years ago, when he was known as Fred Bell, Fahim was a member of the Black Panther Party and headed the Texas chapter. Since 1968, I fought for the freedom of African American people. I fought for freedom and justice for all people, all oppressed people. And I didn't fight to look around in the same neighborhoods where I waged battle to be taken over by crooks and hooligans and uh, drug lords. My resolve is even stronger now since I'm a Muslim. Fahim now attends a mosque located in the heart of the war zone. The Muslim community has historically been able to take that element of people and instill in them a sense of confidence, a sense of pride, a sense of real faith and belief in God. Imam Yakya Abdullah is the spiritual leader of this mosque where the drug problem has become the critical issue. We're talking about this situation in Dallas, but we know it's pervasive in the whole American society. And it's almost a reverse kind of situation where the criminals are at liberty to roam free. And the good people are locking themselves up behind bars in their own homes. And I think that what we have to do as good, conscientious American citizens, we have to say no, no more. That we are not going to lock ourselves up. The criminals should be locked up. The criminals should have fear on them. You all help us to help save the community. Oh, what, what is this for? Last summer, the Muslims organized a new group called AMAN, African American Men Against Narcotics. Their goal was to harass the drug dealers and force them to leave South Dallas. In the shadow of the crack houses, they began by warning the dealers they were being watched. Say anyone selling or buying drugs in this neighborhood, they have your picture taken and your license number recorded. The information will be circulated in the community and also made available to the police. They'll actually sell drugs right down the stairs. So this is a good shot. A man also began taking surveillance photos of suspected crack dealers, identifying them to the police and spreading their names throughout the community. He's definitely a, a drug flunky. Nobody has a right to push poison to other people. 
The drug pusher has no more right doing what he's doing than someone would putting strychnine in the community drinking water. That is not a right. We're the ones who are in the right, and we're doing what we have a right to do. Mobile One, how do you read? Mobile One, do you read us? We're just a group of citizens exercising our First Amendment right to organize and engage in, as I call, civil harassment of the pusher to expose him, make it uncomfortable for him, hopefully to drive him out of that area and keep him moving and running until finally he seeks some other enterprise. After they identified a drug hotspot, a man's strategy was to begin intensive patrols in that one area several days a week. It's quite dangerous. To, to be honest with you, it's quite dangerous, and we never know what to expect. But we're not naive, and we don't take uh, these people for granted. We're very watchful and careful of what we're doing. I want those regulars to a couple of rocks at us. When we're out there on the streets, our alertness, our instincts, all geared up to fight. As we want to walk back through there. We have to worry about who's in that window, who's in that doorway, who's in this car coming down the street. Who's sitting in that car that's sitting beside the street? I'm just praying, you know, that he don't walk out there and some of the head men, or what you call them, the leaders, you know, be out there waiting on him, you know, to just prove that the, he can't stop it, you know, or try to gun him down or something, you know. I just worry about him. As Fahim and the other members of A-Man patrol the war zone, they see themselves as a symbol for the rest of the community that something can be done. I look at it as an organizing project and not a bodyguard thing, even if, even if we have to patrol three days a week for the next year or longer in various areas to keep the example out there. I'm willing and feel obligated to do it. Change, hey, may I help you? Joe Johnson has been a landlord in South Dallas for the last okay, uh, five years. Tell Lee you need to check them real close so they don't take our refrigerator and stove. I'm yeah, highly yeah, against yeah. drugs. I don't lie drugs on my property, period. Johnson owns several apartment buildings and every day faces the threat they will be overrun by crack. So he fights back by immediately evicting any users or dealers who do move in. We check all indications of drugs being used. Most of the time when uh, we put someone out, you can tell whether they own drugs or, or they're selling drugs. You see these bags here? These packages in when they uh, package crack in. When a guy gets on this and he gets on it real heavy, uh, it's cheaper to move him out real quick because you're going to create a problem for everybody. People go to work, can't see. Police officers that drive down through here, they can't see. So anybody can hide in this Ohio. They don't want to go in, but I will. Johnson has also begun to lobby the city to tear down the vacant buildings that surround his properties before they too become drug houses. You need to hurry on out here. The police on their way down here. Yeah. As Johnson and Levi Williams inspected this abandoned house, they suddenly stumbled upon a man with a needle in his arm. Yeah. This is one of the reasons that we don't want to leave a building in this neighborhood unboarded. Well, there's a, something needs to be done about it. And Johnson has also begun to buy and rehab other abandoned buildings in South Dallas, hoping to create drug-free housing for the people who live here. We're not going to ever be able to say there's no more drugs. It's no way. The only thing we do is just slow it down. Don't leave it up there. all these cleanup days South uh -huh. Dallas. Because, see, this is stop uh, crime in your neighborhood, so we ought to say 
Let's see, clean up day, South Dallas neighbor. Why don't you put neighborhood right on there? After months of effort, Dorothy Davis was finally able to organize the first crime watch meeting ever in her neighborhood. You gotta have someone that's gonna have to have contact with the police department. Levi Williams conducted the meeting and brought several police officers to meet with the residents. But most of Dorothy's neighbors were afraid to attend. They are unsure who to trust, simply because if someone finds out uh, that's in a drug arena, so to speak, uh, you can end up getting hurt. So people are pretty hesitant. I doubt it very seriously if the police department along is going to make a tremendous impact on a community without the community support. It is time that we reclaim our rightful role as a leader in the protection of our women and children. That's right. Over the summer, community support for A-Man grew. Now with over 70 active members, they stepped up their direct confrontations with the crack dealers in the war zone. But what we're doing, no one else has dared do. We're challenging the pushers and the drug houses directly. Warning, don't push up. Warning, don't push up. They're watching you. They're watching you. Now what you gonna do? Now what you gonna do? Warning, don't push up. Warning, don't push up. We're gonna make an example out of them. That's right. That's right. That's right. As soon as they touch one of us, right. we're gonna make an example out of some of these dead bodies. That's right. Why should the community help someone that's hurting them? Who's hurting them? The dope ain't your hurting them. Your laws do. I ain't got nothing to do with the law. I don't have anything to do with the law, brother. I don't have nothing to do with the hey, law. Hey, you working for no, If you, that's what you believe. I'm not gonna say I'm gonna quit doing what I'm doing. Well, you know that's against the law, though. You know what, Mr. You know they taking pictures, though. I've been breaking the law ever since the day I was born. We're gonna lay it up. I, you Eighteen-year-old Gerald Ladd is the youngest member of A-Man. The enemy, I can say, is silence among the black people. Silence by ignoring the problems. Silence by not working as a unit to rid of the problem. We can see the government not, is not going to do it. Police force is not going to do it. So we need to actively, as an African-American community, join together. Gerald was born in Dallas and has lived here all of his life. Growing up in South Dallas, you're usually going to be touched in some way by someone who's using drugs. I've seen the effects of a lot of my friends. The majority of young blacks do engage in some type of drug usage and, you know, people do it as an escape. I've seen some do it as a boredom, you know, not really aware of its effects of getting you hooked, you know. I had a lot of friends whose moms were on heroin. If their mom went on heroin, it was uh, drugs they called T's and blues. Was, I don't know what they are, but they were real popular then. And uh, we used to sit around and, and talk about uh, what we want to be when we grow up, how we're not going to be like this. And uh, some of us made it, some of us didn't. That's perfect. Even during high school, I hear things from coaches, from teachers. I, I just hear everything, you know. He's a good student. He's excellent. You know, he's an excellent ball player. But they never knew Chris, really. They never knew who Chris really was. Chris was an addict. All your values change, all, you know, everything that you really love doesn't matter anymore. Because the, when you take that first hit, your mind is like programmed just to to keep feeding yourself more drugs. It's like, it's like, it's just like something to tell you you need another hit. It's just the high, the taste, the high, smell. It's just a rush at the high that it gives you. No other drug gives you that kind of, you know, instant hit. Everything they say about crack is the truth. Some things they just don't even know because the average person who, who's um, 
if they're not using heaven, been through it before, they really can't tell you actually, you know, what, what's happening. But I'm a, you know, I'm a recovering addict, you know, drug user, and I know, you know, I've, I've been there. I've seen it with my own eyes. Because crack is cheap, it is especially attractive to young people. And it has proven to be one of the toughest addictions to treat. Chris and Wayne are among an estimated 4,000 drug users in South Dallas, but few of them get the help they need because in South Dallas, there is only one treatment facility. It's capacity, 55. I saw one of my best friends die behind drugs, you know? Just to sit there and, and, and see, see somebody die behind a, a drug it's hard, you know. It'll, it'll actually change your life. It'll change your life. Having a parent on heroin was hell. Gerald's experience with drugs began at home with his mother's heroin addiction. Occasionally, I would walk in the room unannounced and uh, see a heroin needle and her fixing the... Uh, the heroin and one time I recall at a very young age she called me into the bathroom and and uh, asked me to uh, inject the heroin in her because she was too shaky to do it herself with drug users uh, drug abusive families a lot of things a normal child would expect we were deprived of maybe coming home to some dinner maybe being able to go to school with a pencil and paper. You always craved for a normal childhood. Gerald's childhood was lost to drugs, and so he says he has never used them and never will. Someone has to take the role of leading our people, organizing our people, serving our people. It's time to take action. In the few months A-Man has patrolled South Dallas, drug activity has decreased in the neighborhoods where the group has focused its efforts. It is also clear that the dealers have not left town. They have just moved. We applaud their efforts in that they want a drug-free community uh, for themselves, and, and that's certainly what we want for them. But everything is not real clear-cut. If it began to edge towards vigilantism, I think our attitudes might shift uh, dramatically. Nobody would be permitted to stand out on uh, street corners and flag down cars and sell drugs in the white community. An atmosphere that would justify law enforcement officials themselves calling an area, quote unquote, the war zone, would not be permitted in the white community. It would not be permitted, it would not be tolerated. That's my argument. That's, I feel, a fact. I have no evidence to the contrary. In recent months, there are signs that voices of South Dallas are beginning to be heard. Law enforcement in the United States, that of a Dallas police officer. Thank you so much. City Hall responded to the increased racial tensions by hiring a new police chief, Mac Vines, an outsider from Florida, and gave him the mission of regaining the trust of the minority community. Vines moved quickly. He reassigned Ray Hawkins to another division and then promoted Sergeant Robert Jackson to deputy chief and put him in charge of South Dallas. But many of the old problems persist. Vines recently fired two officers for beating a black man, and the shootings continue. And South Dallas is still waiting for the city to begin to take action to correct its deep economic and social problems. We're going to get this place back to where it should be. God bless you all. But a man continues to celebrate its small victories. Thank you. In this one apartment complex, a man patrolled, the residents organized, and together they pushed the pushers out. Collectively, we can solve this problem. Step by step, we're determined 
And amen commends you today. At the Davis home, it's quieter now. The crack dealers who shot up this neighborhood have moved on to another part of South Dallas. It's a beautiful neighborhood. It just needs a, a little nurturing and a little care. But if it comes to the point that we're fighting a losing battle, then I guess we'll do like other people have done. But I intend to give it my last shot. This spring, at a White House luncheon, President Bush honored 28 heroes in the war on drugs. Dorothy Davis was one of them. The president called them all hometown heroes, unconventional heroes in an unconventional war, who were proving that America could, in fact, win the war on drugs. Thank you for joining us. I'm Judy Woodruff. Good night.